Lord's Supper is a covenant sign and seal. And that means that it both represents to us and confirms to us a promise of God, the precious promise of God that through Jesus Christ, He will be our God and we are His people. And in the Lord's Supper, we have a remembrance, a celebration of God's presence, an experience of communion. We also have something that nourishes us and in the Lord's Supper, we anticipate the glory to come. Let me think with you about those few things for a moment. First of all, we have a remembrance in the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus told His disciples that they were going to proclaim His death until He comes. The bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper is a representation of a covenant sacrifice. That's the two constituent parts of a covenant sacrifice. It indicates that Jesus' death was a deliberate act on His part of giving Himself as a sacrifice in our place for the forgiveness of our sins. And so every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are to remember the meaning and significance of the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. We are to remember Him. Do this in remembrance of me. Proclaim my death until I come. We celebrate the glorious work of atonement that Jesus Christ accomplished for us. But the Lord's Supper is also a celebration of God's presence. Isn't it amazing that we're invited to slide our knees up under the table of God? That is especially amazing in light of our rebellion. You know, in Genesis 3, Satan said to Eve and to Adam, Take and eat this fruit. And they ate the fruit against God's command. And what did it result in? Did it result in their satisfaction and fulfillment? No. It resulted in their being driven away from the presence of God. But at the Lord's table, the Lord Himself invites us back into His presence. And He says, slide your knees up under my table. And think again. When Jesus says to His disciples, take and eat, He has reversed the words of the serpent in the garden. Derek Kidner has this wonderful line. It required the sending of the Son of God into this world and His dying on the cross before take and eat became verbs of salvation. And we experience that every time we come to the Lord's table and we hear the minister say, Take and eat, all of you. It's a celebration of our reunion with God, His presence with us, our enjoyment of His near fellowship. And of course, that's the next thing that the Lord's Supper is. It's a communion. It's a communion with God and with His people. We not only commune with a living God by grace, we not only commune with a living God by what Jesus has done for us on the cross, but we commune with one another. When we're united to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're united to everyone who is united to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says to the Corinthians, you must discern the body. He's not telling them that they need to understand some mystical thing about the elements in the Lord's Supper. What's the body that he's talking about? The body of Christ, the church, the fellowship of believers. And when we come to the Lord's table, we not only commune with God, but we commune with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Sinclair Ferguson recently sent a note to Alistair Begg in which he said, Alistair, I've been meditating on the glorious atoning work of Jesus Christ without which you and I would not be brothers and without which we wouldn't even know one another. Isn't that a glorious picture of what the gospel does? It not only reconciles us to God, but it gives us a multitude of brothers and sisters from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation throughout history and in glory above. We celebrate that at the Lord's Supper, that we're united to God through Jesus Christ and we're united to one another. But the Lord's Supper is also spiritual nourishment. It's a means of grace. It's one of God's appointed ways by which He builds us up and nourishes us, confirms our faith, strengthens us for growth. And the Lord's Supper is an anticipation of the glory to come. Jesus washed His disciples' feet on the night that He was betrayed. 
and he served to them the elements of the Lord's Supper. But you know, there's this very interesting passage in Luke chapter 12, verse 37, when he's speaking of the marriage supper of the Lamb in consummation, in glory, when the great end has come and all have acknowledged him to be king. Do you know what he says in that passage? He says, when that day comes, he will bid us all to recline, just like the disciples reclined on the night of the Lord's Supper, and he will gird himself and he will serve us. One of my professors asked Wilbur Wallace, who was a professor of New Testament at Covenant Theological Seminary many years ago, Wilbur, does that mean that Jesus will serve us at the marriage feast of the Lamb? Dr. Wallace said to my professor, did you ever think that you wouldn't need your Savior to serve you? Yes, in the Lord's Supper, we anticipate the marriage supper of the Lamb in which we sit down with one another in glory and our Savior serves us again everything that we need. What a joy it is to come to the Lord's table.